Real-time apps are super popular these days. Figma lets designers collaborate in a shared canvas. Trading apps like Robinhood and Coinbase push the latest prices to their customers. And messaging apps bring people together. For better or worse, users expect updates in real time. They get frustrated when info is delayed or they have to do something so barbaric as refreshing a page. For this reason, I want to walk through four real-time web techniques, comparing and contrasting them so you can make the right choice for your app. My name is Christian, and this is Code and Stuff, a place where I write code and do stuff. Now, before I get into this, I need to address something that pedantic folks inevitably comment every time someone says real time. There's a very specialized field of computing that has its own definition of the term real time. In this video, I'm talking about what normal humans would call real time, stuff that updates quickly without reloading a page. With that out of the way, let's get started. Around the year 2000, a JavaScript class called XML HTTP Request entered the scene. This allowed an interactive web page to make a connection and request information from a server. In recent years, the archaic XHR has been replaced with a method called fetch. I'm not going to get into the differences here, just know that JavaScript made fetch happen. Pretty quickly, developers realized that they could have a page periodically ask for the latest data and update the screen. This primitive form of real-time applications is very similar to the phenomena where children on a road trip inquire about the family's distance from their destination. The classic, are we there yet? It's very easy to imagine how this might be implemented. To demonstrate all of these real-time web techniques, I'm going to work with a web server that increments a counter in the backend. This is being modeled in a library called RxJS, but that's not too important. In reality, this could be replaced with a feed of events happening in your application's domain. I'll also be using plain JavaScript on the front end, since frameworks may introduce their own complex abstractions and distract us from core concepts. All of the code from this video can be found on GitHub, link in the description. First, let's set up a web handler that provides the latest value of our counter in the backend. When this route is called, we just get the number back. Now on the front end, let's make a fetch. Here we can see that data being fetched one time. Now to turn this into a poll, we'll call our poll method with a set timeout to create a loop. A value of 2000 means we want this to request information and then wait two seconds before doing it again. And now, we can see the latest info every two seconds. Now you might be thinking, if the counter increments every second, we're missing like half of the updates. Following that logic, let's just go to an extreme and pull 10 times per second. I'm gonna change this 2000 to 100. Now we get updates immediately, but if we look in the network tab, there's a huge number of requests. This is now incredibly wasteful. Every request puts pressure on the server, uses up the user's bandwidth, and there isn't even a guarantee that there's new data available. In a real app, you may never know when to expect data. This is the problem with polling. It's inefficient. To address this, the industry came up with another technique, and it's called long polling. The concept of long polling is similar to polling with one key difference. Instead of having the server give you stale data, it keeps the connection open and only responds when it has new info available. There's no rules that say a server needs to respond to an HTTP request immediately, so we just don't. To set up a long polling endpoint, we need to tell the browser to keep the connection alive because we don't yet have data. Then, when the next data point becomes available, we send it to the client and close the connection. On the front end, the implementation is nearly identical to regular polling. The only difference is that we'll use a timeout of zero between requests. All of the waiting is done on the back end, so there's no need for us to introduce any additional delays. Why use set timeout of zero instead of just using tail recursion and calling long pull? Feel free to try it. I imagine you'll hit a stack overflow error after a while. Reason is, every time a function is called, the JavaScript runtime keeps track of the functions that called it, and who called that one, and so on and so on. But that has a limit. Set timeout breaks us out of this tracking and gives each function its own fresh context. Now, when we open the browser, we get the latest info the moment it's available. A quick look at the network tab shows one long request per value. Long polling was a huge improvement over polling, but it comes with its own drawbacks. Some servers and networking equipment may not like keeping HTTP requests open for a long time. In addition, new requests need to be made every time data has been sent. 
Every network request involves a ton of back and forth interactions to get the client and server talking, especially with HTTPS. To fix this, let's take a look at something a bit newer. It's called server sent events. Server sent events haven't been very popular, but they're a great way to directly send updates from a backend to a front end. They're an official web standard and have a robust client implementation built into JavaScript through the event source class. Very recently, these have been adopted for a special use case that I'm sure you've interacted with, streaming tokens from AI large language models to the client. When you watch ChatGPT typing a few characters at a time, this data is coming in as a series of server sent events. So let's get started and build the backend. Much like long polling, we need to let the browser know how to wait for data and not hang up on us. We also use a special content type, text slash event stream. Server sent events are separated by a double new line, and their data section starts with the string literal data colon space. There are other fields that can be set, but they're not necessary for our demo. In this case, we'll send a new event every time a new count value is available. Now on the front end, it's gonna be a little different from polling. We're gonna construct a new event source instance and add a listener for the message event. Whenever a message is received, we update the element on our page. And just like that, it's working. In the dev tools, notice that there's just one connection sending all of the events. This is really efficient. If you have data to stream to the browser, server sent events are a great choice. So you might be wondering, if server sent events are so good, why aren't they more popular? Why didn't they catch on until now? The answer to this is also the fourth real-time technique, WebSockets. WebSockets are very different from everything else we've talked about. The biggest difference is that WebSockets are duplex. In addition to streaming events from the server to the client, they also let the client talk back to the server in the same connection. It turns out most real-time applications benefit from two-way communication. Imagine if Figma needed to make a post request every time a user's cursor moved. What a waste. If there's a chance that you'll need to frequently send data back and forth, WebSockets might be for you. Because they're a bit complicated, I'm gonna use a node module called WS to manage the WebSocket protocol. There are similar libraries in every programming language and several available for Node.js. I just chose this one. The life of a WebSocket starts out the same as an HTTP request, but it has the WS or WSS protocol. If the server supports this protocol, it sends back an HTTP response code of 101 defined as switching protocols. In backend parlance, this interaction tends to be called an upgrade. Let's create an instance of the WebSocket server class from the WS package and wire it up with our web server's upgrade event. When this happens, let's send a connection event to the WebSocket server. Now we can register a handler for this connection event that creates a subscription to our event source, just like server sent events did. And finally, when the socket closes, let's unsubscribe. That's all it takes to stream events from the backend through a WebSocket. There are a bunch of event handlers available to receive messages back from the client, but I'm not going down that rabbit hole today. On the front end, this is gonna look very similar to server sent events. We create a new instance of a client class, in this case, WebSocket, and then we wire up an event listener to update our page. And just like that, we have live data streaming down. In the dev tools, this looks similar to the server sent event. Notice the arrow indicating the server sent the message down to us. So that's it, four real-time web techniques to get data from the back end to the front end. The next time you're building a real-time app, consider which technique is right for you. Do you want something super simple to get started? Or do you have a really predictable cadence for data refreshes? Simple polling might be enough. Do you want to avoid wasteful requests that come back with identical data? Maybe long polling is for you. Do you want to send a stream of data from the server? Consider server sent events. And finally, if you need bi-directional communication, WebSockets may be the best bet. That's all I have for today. If you liked this video or found it useful, please do the YouTube things. Like, subscribe, and share it with others who might benefit. If this inspired a thought, or you have an idea for another topic to dive into, consider leaving a comment. This has been Code and Stuff. Thanks for watching.